Hi, my name is Maddie. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Movement Youth. Also, please make sure to sign up for DNOW, which is February 21st through the 23rd. For now, let's get to this week's message. We started this relationship series two weeks ago, and we said, hey, we're going to do a relationship series. We called it Relationship Goals, and we're going to talk about singleness and dating and marriage. And that's kind of the progression of a relationship from a single person to an older person who's married. And we started thinking, well, how are we going to talk about marriage with middle schoolers, and, and I know some of you guys were like, well, why are they sending the middle schoolers out anyway? Why are they sending middle schoolers out of the room? Is I know what it's going to be. It's going to be a sex talk. They're going to give us a sex talk, and it's going to be awkward. And somebody asked me, they were like, is this message going to be like rated R? Is that what this is about to be? No, it's not rated R. And we might like browse over the topic of sex, but it's not really the point of the message. Uh, it's just a little bit less immediately applicable for middle school. Uh, so here's why we wanted to talk about this with you guys. We want to talk about marriage in particular. And some of you guys are like, I'm easily three, four, five years away from even possibly being able to get married, right? Maybe you're here with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Like, I want you to just look at each other real quick and just say, no pressure. Just look at each other real quick, say, no pressure. All right, this is not a you better propose within the next six months kind of me message. It's not anything like that. But here's why we have to talk about marriage. Serious note, here's why we have to talk about marriage. Because progressively, we're getting worse at marriage as a society. Did you know that this is true? Um, for, for a long, long time, like we, we've been using these words like progressive and advanced. Like we've advanced as a society in so many ways. And as a culture, we're so much more progressive in a lot of ways. And I think that's true in some areas. But when it comes to marriage, there's like literal data that's showing us we're getting worse at marriage. Uh, did you know this, that 50% of marriages end in divorce? 50%, which tells us that in a room this size, and uh, even with some of our middle schoolers, we just sent them out with enough people in the room, uh, that a lot of you come from families where your parents were divorced, or maybe you're in a second marriage or something along those lines. So I don't want you to get the idea that, you know, that we think that's evil and, and awful and sinful. And that, that's not it at all. But I, I would venture to say that when your parents got married to their first spouse, they probably said, hey, this is till death do us part. That it wasn't the plan to break up, you know, five, ten years later down the road. And so I want us to look at the idea of marriage. And some of you guys will be like, well, 50%, that rule, that sounds like maybe that's, you know, like, well, we're Christians. We love Jesus. And we're, you know, excited about trying to follow the Bible. That 50% number, that's probably taking into account a bunch of people who aren't Christians. Well, the truth is that the stats are about the same in the church. The stats are almost exactly the same, about 50% of marriages in the church end in divorce. So we want to talk about this, and uh, we're going to talk about it in a, in a pretty quick way. We're not going to go forever and ever and ever. Uh, but going into a marriage, or even just thinking about marriage, like how many of you would say, hey, I've thought about marriage? By show of hands, by show of hands, by show of hands. None, none of you have thought about marriage? You're a bunch of liars, okay? You've you thought about marriage, and that's okay. Um, hey, we can't send all of the energy out of the room with the middle schoolers. We can't do it. We can't do it, right? This is not going to be an awkward message. I think there's something that we can all learn from this. Uh, if, if you're here, say, I'm here. I'm here. All right, if, if you're with me, say, I'm with you. All right, some of you are with me. I'll work on the rest of you uh, as we get through the message. But as you think about marriage... And as you're in a relationship, as you get closer to marriage, there's all these expectations that are rolling around in your brain. And you might not even realize that they're there. But you have expectations, whether you've ever voiced them, or you've just kind of thought them subconsciously, or you've like literally said, I know exactly what kind of expectations I have for my husband. So let's, let's just kind of have a little fun to begin with. Uh, girls, girls, girls. Uh, can, the, can the girls just by round of applause for if the girls are here, if the ladies are here, the women folk? If the, 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 the ladies are here, girls, when you guys think about marriage, a lot of the times you are thinking about marriage in terms of, listen, I just cannot wait to be the power couple. I can't wait to be the cute power couple. I'm going to be like that one group on Instagram. Like they're always traveling and things like that. Like, and, and traveling is an expectation for marriage. You're like, we're going to be the bucket list family. We're going to have the cutest little posts and we're going to go to China and we're all going to go, ee! We're in China, and you wish that you were us, and you've got these expectations for marriage. You're going to travel. They're going to be super cute on Instagram, and that you're going to have a big following or things like that. You've got expectations that, listen, girls, you are looking forward to having a husband one day because you're like, 
I'm going to have a full-time cuddle partner, buddy. And my husband's just always going to want to cuddle. And whenever I say, hey, want to cuddle, he's going to be like, yes, I do want to cuddle. Please, can we cuddle? And he's going to be so excited to cuddle with you. And then when you uh, see each other after a long day of work, girls, some of you guys in your mind, you're like, listen, when we come home from work, he's just going to ask me about my day all day long. And I'm going to be like, I'm so glad you asked. And then I'm going to get to tell him, well, here's what happened in my day. And really, here's what happened in my whole life. And you're just going to have somebody to talk to and have long conversations and talk to and talk to and talk to. And you've got that expectation. And the truth is that a lot of times, guys are really bad listeners. Anybody want to say amen? Uh, guys are really bad listeners, and it doesn't get better just because we've put a, a piece of metal on our finger. Like, we're bad listeners before we're married, and we're bad listeners as, after we're married. Yeah, you, you, you're nodding your head because you know it's true. Uh, we're not good listeners. And if you have a husband one day who does a good job of listening to you and going, uh-huh, yeah, no, that's true. I can't believe she said that. If you've got a husband like that, know that he loves you, and he's working super, super hard to be that engaged because he's ADD. He is ADD is all get out, and he, has, he is fighting a tendency to zone out or to change the subject or to start talking about something else because that's just that's who guys are. Guys, you have expectations as well. Some of you guys, you're Christians, and that's cool. That's awesome. Some of you guys, maybe you, you came here, and you're not a believer, but you, regardless, you have some similar expectations. Guys, in your mind, marriage one day is going to be one giant sex party. It's going to be forever, and you're always going to be like, listen, this has been off limits my whole life. I see so many people blushing right now. This whole series was worth it for what I'm watching right now. So many guys are blushing. Their faces are like, oh, he knows. Yeah, I know, because I was one of you. Uh, you have these expectations of it's going to be, listen, it's off limits now, right? I'm dating, I'm not married, and I know that marriage is when you can have sex, because that's when God, you know, desi who designed sex, says that you can have sex. And so you're like, as soon as we get married, as soon as I get married one day, I don't even know who I'm going to marry, but one day, that person, it's going to be every day. It's going to be whenever I'm in the mood, and there's going to be, like, no rules whatsoever. And here's the thing, I, you laugh and we joke, but here's the truth that most of us, especially guys, but sometimes girls too, we've got a twisted view of what sex is because we've learned subconsciously or directly what it is from TV, from movies, from pornography, and that's a twisted, unrealistic idea of what sex is. And, and some of you guys, this is what was sad, uh, when you have unrealistic expectations, listen, if you're, unless you're getting married like tomorrow and you're like, I already got all this, please take notes, please take notes. I wish that I had taken notes. I wish that somebody had shared the passage of scripture with me that we're gonna look at tonight. Take notes. When you have unrealistic expectations, you develop unhealthy solutions. Unrealistic expectations lead to unhealthy solutions. And so some of you guys, like I said, guys, maybe even girls, you're, you're addicted to pornography in this season of life, and that breaks my heart. That's terrible. The pornography industry makes more money than the NFL, the NBA, and the MLB combined, and that's disgusting. But it's got a grip on so many people's lives, and you're thinking, well, listen, this is just going to get me by so long as, as, I'm, as I'm dating. But once I get married, you know, once I'm married, I won't need pornography, or I won't need to look at other people like that, because I'll have my wife, or I'll have my husband, and that'll be the fulfillment of all my needs, and I'll be good. But the truth is that you've got an unrealistic expectation for that, that relationship, and so you're learning what, what, what sex is from, from, from pornography and th things like that. And I can't tell you, that there are millions of married Christian men who are addicted to pornography. And they're addicted to pornography because they got an appetite for something that's unrealistic. And so when they got married, they, they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is nothing like Girls Gone Wild. This is not what I thought I was signing up for. This is not what I thought I was going to get when I got married. And so... They're still addicted to pornography, even though they're in a marriage, even though they're, they're, they're committed to somebody. And so we're going to look at some of these unrealistic expectations. We're going to kind of compare them with uh, biblical expectations, godly expectations of what marriage is. Like, I, I want to burst bubbles tonight. I want to burst bubbles and then actually show you that if we look at the biblical expectations, if we're aiming for what God says marriage is supposed to look like, if we're aiming for, for those kind of uh, expectations, then you're going to be set up for something that's even better than the fake trash that the media have, have taught you and, and made you look forward to. So let's do this. Let's pray, and then let's jump into the Word. Pray with me. Bow your heads. Dear God, I pray, Lord, that you would 
Lord, you help us to be vulnerable. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take this seriously. God, I pray that you would help us to look closely at expectations and thoughts and patterns in our lives and change them now, Lord. Whether we're two years away from being married or, or 10, God, I pray that you would, you would speak to us tonight in an eternal way from your eternal word. Lord, you would change minds and change hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, hey guys, go ahead and grab your Bibles. I hope you brought your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Oh no, Clint, this has been my fear, that a lot of the cheering in the room has been our middle schoolers, and our middle schoolers are more hyped for the Bible than our high schoolers, because they're like, I'm cool now. I go to a high school now. I don't, I don't, I don't cheer. So let's get lit for God's word. We're going to Ephesians chapter 5. Thank you. Okay, I feel so much better. I feel so much better. And somebody's still hung up. Did he say lit? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm ready to be the embarrassing, awkward dad. I'm so ready. Hey, there's three realities of marriage that I want you to get tonight. And I'm not here to share with you, hey, I have a perfect marriage. And I've been married for three whole years, so I've got this figured out. I don't want, I'm not going to say this is do what I do. I'm going to say do what God says to do. I'm going to say realize what God says about marriage, not what Zach says about marriage. So uh, look with me. We're in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 21. And the first reality of marriage that I want you to take note of is submission. Say submission. It is not like a, a cool word. It is not like a flashy word that makes you go, wow, that is like, I can't wait, you know, wives to submit to my husbands one day. That's just going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Look over there with me, though, at verse 21 in Ephesians 5. This is what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And here's why we've got to start at verse 21. Because so often, maybe you've heard, how many, but just by show of hands, you've heard that verse or something that sounds kind of like that before. You're like, eh, it sounds vaguely familiar, right? If you've grown up in church, you've been like, hey, wives, well, submit to your husbands. And you're familiar with that. And I'm not going to tell you that that's not biblical, but I'm telling you it's not the whole picture. Because a lot of us guys, were like, I think this is a southern thing. I think this is like a macho, like masculinity thing. We're like, yeah. And, and listen, you're, you're nudging your girlfriend right now. Please stop. And you're going, huh, you're going to have to do what I tell you to one day. You know, ha, huh. Stop. Because the very first verse says, submit to one another. And you know what that sounds like? You know what that sounds like? Submitting to one another? Hey, honey, where do you want to go eat? No, 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 where do you want to go eat? No, 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 where, where do you want to go eat? And so submitting to one another, and sometimes on a Friday night when you're trying to decide what to do, can take a long time, and it can be inconvenient at times. But in all, all jokes aside, deferring to one another is what this is getting at here. Hey, how do you think we should raise our kids? I don't know, let's discuss this together. Right? This is not a, a dictatorship. This is not a monarchy where the man is like, I am man, and I make the rules in this house. I, I don't think that's gentleness. I don't think that's kindness. I don't think that's anything like what Paul is going to describe in the next verses. So don't take that verse out of context. Now, it does say right after that, right after, it says, you know, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And so that's a big ask. That's a really big question that's a really big thing to ask of anybody and this is not a very like culturally uh correct or politically correct uh passage for us to look at because you'd be like i'm a woman i don't have to do anything that a man tells me to do i don't have to do but just because he's a man well let's look really carefully at what it says and what it doesn't say so it says wives submit to your husbands but we got this up on the screen someone once pointed out that it does not say women submit to men can the ladies say amen ladies want to say amen please four of you, okay. It doesn't say women submit to men. So all jokes aside, if you've got a boyfriend at any point who says, hey, you have to do what I tell you to, God said so, or the Bible says so, tell him to leave. Tell him, boy, bye. No, I don't have to do what you tell me to just because you're a man. That's not biblical. It doesn't say women submit to men, and it doesn't say wives submit to sin. So I've, I've, I've heard so, too many stories of, of wives and husbands who end up in an abusive relationship where a, a, a woman is being taken advantage of, even hurt, whether 
physically or verbally or emotionally by men, they're like, well, I have to submit to him. Yeah, but you don't have to submit to sin. If a, if a man is ever telling you to do something that is unbiblical or ungodly, you don't have to listen to him. And I know that it's still a big ask. Submission is, is, is difficult. And saying, I have a different opinion, but I'm going to go with you. I'm going to submit to your leadership. I know that that's a big ask. But hold on and look at this second reality, because I think it frames it up better. The second reality for marriage, second reality of marriage, is sacrifice. Say sacrifice. This really frames it up totally different. This is why you can't just read the Bible out of context. You can't just like pick one verse and be like, aha, see, submit, aha, I'm in charge. You can't do anything, and not just with this topic, but with any topic. And, and this is what it says. Look at verse 25 through 27 with me. We're going to read the next chunk. So wives, albeit you have to submit to your husbands, but husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, I would put it to you that that is even a little bit bigger ask than telling why do you need to submit to your husbands? Because it's not just saying, hey, it's not like a, like a band-aid. Yeah, but... Husbands, be nice to her. Husbands, don't, don't get out of control. It's not a Band-Aid. It's not a, uh, you know, something slapped on there as an extra or as, an, as a by the way. Because uh, look very closely at, at the lyrics. Uh, the, uh, lyrics. If we can get the verses back up there, I would like to look at that one more time. I don't have those verses. I'm so sorry. I thought I gave you those verses. Uh, reading in your Bible in verse 25, it says, Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, hold on. Okay, that's more specific. How did Christ love the church? He laid his life down for her. Or uh, the translation I read out of NIV says, he gave himself up for her. Now, we're talking about a whole different kind of love. This is why last week, when we were in the dating series, and if, you didn't, if you're just here for the first night and you didn't hear about the, the dating message or the singleness message, please go back and watch those. Uh, this is kind of one big sermon. We're just doing it over three weeks because we don't want to be here for an hour and a half. But this is why last week I said, hey, I don't think it's really the best idea. I'm not saying it's a sin, but I don't think it's the best idea for a girlfriend or a guy, a boyfriend to say, I love you, especially really early on in a relationship. Because I know what you mean. You're like, I really, really, really like you. I think you can really, 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 really like somebody, and you don't have to say I love you. Because what we're saying in here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, is, is that love is laying down your life for somebody, and men, especially the love that you're called to one day give your wife, is sacrificing yourself for her. So how did Jesus do that? He, was, he allowed himself to be nailed to a cross. When, when have you ever had to lay down your life in anything even close to that? And I think it's great that you're chivalrous and you're like, well, I paid for dinner when we go on a date. That's great. Keep doing that. But that's not sacrificing. That's not laying down your life. Look to her needs as more significant than your own. You can look at Philippians chapter 2 with me. Uh, we won't have time to go there because we're short on time. But in Philippians chapter 2, he says, let's make my joy complete by ha having the same mind, same love, being of one accord. And look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so that's, the whole, that's what Paul is getting at here. It's the same guy that wrote Philippians and, and the same guy that wrote this letter, Ephesians. He says, look to her. Her interests, guys, let me see your eyes. Gentlemen, let me see your eyes. Look to your future wife's interests as more significant than your own. Look to what makes her more comfortable as the weaker vessel, as, as, as literally not as big and strong as you, and, and take care of her. And, and, and when it comes to like preferences and opinions, yeah, you need to lead your family, you need to lead your wife, but can I just tell you guys, when it comes time to choosing the color that you're going to paint the house, your opinion means absolute squat. It really does. It means nothing. It has no weight in the conversation whatsoever. Uh, honey, you want to say amen? Yeah, so she, I know, I know, I know. I've tried, and I'm telling you that because I've, I've, she can tell you, I've, I tried arguing. But when you say, hey, I am, I'm going to lay down my opinion. I'm going to lay down what I want. I'm going to lay down what makes me most comfortable. I'm going to lay down what I think would look good. You're saying, hey, what you want is more important. He says, washing with water through the word. Look at that verse with me one more time. In verse uh, 27, 20, 26, 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present, him, to present her to himself as a radiant church. So he's talking about wives and the church and, and Jesus and church and wives and husbands, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But why does he say to present your wife in that way? Why does he do that? Here's, here's what you need to remember. Um, a lot of us guys, when you get married, you're going to have this tendency to try to boss her around. You're going to have this tendency to try to you know, be in control. And, and that's something that we're going to battle as men because, yes, you need to lead, but you also need to defer. And, you, you, yes, you need to be strong, but you also need to be gentle. And what you need to keep in mind is that your wife, your one-day spouse, she's got the Holy Spirit too. She's got God's word. She's not a child, and you don't need to talk to her and, 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 and order her around or anything along those lines. And some of you guys, like, I'm, I'm moving really, really quick because we're short on time. But some of you guys, you're asking the question, well, Zach, do you think I'm marriage material? Or do you think, do you think I'm ready to get married? Or one day you're going to be asking yourself, like, I'm thinking about proposing, but I don't know if I'm a marriage material. Like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And the, a really good litmus test for that is how much time have you spent in the Bible today? Because look at this really quickly. He says, through the washing of the word, he's not talking about baptism. He's not talking about, you know, getting dunked. We, we love baptism. Baptism is, in, in, is awesome. But he's not talking about that cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, through God's word. What that means is that when you spend time in the Bible, a little bit of God rubs off on you. When you spend time in God's word, you, you wake up early and you read the Bible in the morning, then some of, some of uh, the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, oh, you gotta stop that. And, and so you, you need to be spending time in God's word. And one of the biggest uh, qualifications for somebody getting married is, hey, uh, how is your walk with Jesus? Because we said it back in the singleness message. If you're not leading yourself well, you have no business trying to lead somebody else well. Don't do it. Don't bring that mess into somebody else's relationship. Get yourself organized and get yourself close to Jesus before you do anything along those lines. we got to go quick. The third reality of marriage is service. Say service. service. Thank you. The third reality of marriage is service. I want to I read verse 28 through 30. In this same way, still talking to husbands here, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Now, let me ask you guys a question. If, if I'm hungry, I get hungry, I'm kind of hungry right now, but typically when I'm hungry, what do you think I do? I eat. You guys are good. All right, let's try another one. When I get thirsty, what do you think I do? You guys are smart. When I get hungry, I eat something. When I'm thirsty, I drink something. When, when, my, when I'm in pain, I, 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 I look to get rid of whatever is causing me pain. Whenever I'm in danger, I get on the defense mode. And I say, um, stop that. Don't, don't hurt me. Don't, don't put me in any kind of danger. Listen, when my wife gets hungry, what do you think she does? No, no, she gets hangry. She does not eat. She gets hangry. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's when you get so hungry that you get angry. Uh, this is a, a real thing. And somebody was just telling me, I haven't checked this up. I'm not, I'm not a biologist, but somebody was telling me that girls, uh, when you get hungry, there are sometimes, actually, when you go a certain number of hours without eating, uh, that actually certain hormones release, and they're like, time to feed me. I'm like, I, I want food. And so, guys, sometimes you'll be going on a date and, or you'll just be hanging out with a girl that you like and, 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 and she starts getting real grumpy. And then she starts looking out the passenger side window and she won't even look at you. And you're like, what's the matter? And she's like, Ugh. And you're like, what, what's going on? Is this only my wife? Maybe this is only my wife. But anyway, Janae, sometimes she gets grumpy and she goes, Ugh. And I'm like, what's the matter? Oh, you're hungry. You need food. Okay, Jace is, Jace is the, I'm not the, alone on this. You got to feed them. And I'm, jo I'm, I'm, I'm being playful. I'm being playful. But in all honesty, like, look to her needs before you look to your own. And here's, here's something I wrote down as a note for you to take. You never look more like Jesus than when you're serving your wife. You never look more like Jesus than when you're serving your wife. And if you're like, I, I want to get married, I want to get married, I can't wait to get wifed up, I can't wait to, you know, it's going to be so great, and, and, and forever sex party, and it's going to be great, and guys, you've got these unrealistic expectations, throw those in the trash, and and. And some of you, I need to just point, ask you point blank. Okay, are you ready to serve? 
I'm ready for marriage. Are you ready to wash dishes? You think I'm lying. You think that's like a, like a, a, a sitcom joke. Oh, he never washes the dishes. No, that is real. Are you ready to vacuum? Are you ready to clean? Are you ready to fold laundry? And you're like, oh, my wife's going to do all of that. That's bogus. And that's not a knock on a wife. That, but if you've got these expectations of, well, my, my, my wife's going to do all of those things, and I'm going to sit on the couch, and that's trash. And you're right. You should not get married right now. Don't do it. Change your, your expectations or you're going to start looking for some really unhealthy solutions. And so this is one reason, my, my biggest advice, some of you guys are, you have roommates now because you're living at home. You've got siblings. How many of you guys got siblings? By round of applause, by round of applause. You got some siblings? Okay, good. Most of you. If you don't have a sibling, you need to spend the night at your friend's house a lot. You need to have your friends spend the night at your house because if you've got siblings, then you are already in training for marriage. You really are. Like, don't be, and you don't got to make it weird. You are already in training for marriage because when you see dirty dishes in the, in the pile that your, your sister left or that your brother left, there's a big, huge pile of dirty dishes. You need to go up to them and say, hey, thank you. Thank you so much because you're training me for marriage. This is what marriage is going to be like. I'm going to serve my wife. I'm going to serve. I'm going to look to my husband's needs as well. Somebody's got to do it. Step up and serve. I don't think, listen, if you're in college, uh, hot take, I don't think you should be uh, staying by yourself. I don't think you should, I think you need to get a roommate. Because, and, and preferably a really messy roommate. Like somebody say, hey, amen, you need to go get you a dirty roommate. Oh, you got one already, okay, awesome. You need to go get you a dirty roommate who leaves some, some messes in the kitchen and who leaves their dirty clothes all over the living room and you're like, this is disgusting, why? Because you're gonna have somebody in your life that is the exact same way. And you're feel like, no, I'm not. Well, then you are the person in somebody else's life who's going to be the slob. That's, that's just a, you're like, oh, now it makes more sense. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm this revelation just coming out of, out of God's word. Hey, I'll give you a real life example. Uh, how many of you guys love sleep? You love sleep? By, by a round of applause, somebody say hallelujah, amen. Mm. I have like, like, like a love affair with my bed. I love sleep. I just, uh, I just... Sometimes when I, when I go down to bed, when I go, get ready to go to sleep, I'm like, oh, yes, this is it. Oh, this is the We got the lights off. And I used to people th think people were so extra when they had these eye patches. Now I got the eye patches. I'm like, oh, I'm about to go into my zone. I'm just going gonna, gonna to sleep. Oh, I can't wait to sleep. Sleep is so, so good. And then the lights are off, and I've already locked the doors, and I've turned the lights off in the whole house. And, and Janae's reminded me to, to lock the doors in the house, and, and I'm laying down. I'm like, this is, this is it. This is the moment. And then I, we got the lights off. Eye patches are on. I'm rolled over. I like to sleep on my left side. I was kind of sleeping like this for a while, but now I'm on a left side kind of mood. And, and then I get ready to go to sleep. I'm so close. I'm almost asleep. And then Janae goes, babe, are you awake? And I'm, well, yeah, now I am. I'm awake. I'm awake. Um, well, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm like, that's, that's so cool. That's, wow, that's good that you're thirsty. Um, I'll pray for you. I will. I'm, I'm, I'm almost asleep now. No, I got to get up and go get her some water. I, I, listen, me and Jeanette, we both got a, a cup of water. I'll go get my water, no problem. But sometimes I pout about it when I got to go get her a cup of water. Like, guys, get up and go get your wife a cup of water. Don't be a bum like I was in the first year of our marriage, for crying out loud, if that's the one thing that you get. Because she's thirsty. And I'm loving her as my own body, so that means I'm thirsty. And that's marriage. If you're not ready for, for service, you're not ready for marriage. And yes, I know some of you guys are like, but, but the Instagram posts, we're going to look so cute. You are. You're going to look adorable. Praise Jesus. That's great. Marriage is awesome. And you get to do a lot of those fun things. And, and yeah, you're going to, uh, I think sex is, is honoring to God. I think that God designed sex for marriage. Have a lot of sex and, and do all those kind of things inside marriage when you're married. Don't quote me out of context. But you've got to have realistic, biblical expectations, or else you're going to start looking for solutions in the wrong places. Maybe some of you guys know this. We've got to go quick. Maybe some of you guys noticed, as we were going through all those verses, you started seeing, like, like he keeps talking about Jesus in the church. And we, we're going to throw these verses up real quick. He keeps talking about Jesus in the church and husbands and wives. And is it that just that Jesus and the church are like a really good analogy for marriage? Yes, but it's actually more than that. So look at some of this. He's got, you know, as you do to the Lord... 
as Christ is the head of the church, as Christ submits to the church, as the church submits to Christ, as Christ loved the church in the same way, just as Christ does the church. So he's going back and forth, and he's like, husbands, wives, and Jesus in the church, and husbands and wives and Jesus in the church, and, and submit and, and love and, and, and look to their own interests, and husbands and wives and Jesus in the church. And you're like, why are you getting that, Paul? He's trying to give you a hint that you're missing it, that w- marriage is about so much more than a big, long sex party. It's so about so much more than, well, I'm going to have this, and I can't wait for it. It's going to be just right the way that, and it's about so much more than a cuddle person or a, or a long conversation partner. Marriage, what if? Marriage was designed from the beginning to be a mirror image of the way that God loved us. And so it makes you think about marriage in a totally different way, and it should feel like a way more serious commitment. And you should ask yourself, I was thinking about marriage, but now I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to try to represent what Jesus did for the church, the way that God loved the church. And so Jesse's here to play, and we're going to have a time of invitation. Here's what I, I, some of you guys, you came here tonight and you're like, marriage? That is so far away. I don't know that that is at all something that's on my radar. I don't even know if I ever want to get married. I don't know if anybody would want to marry me. And maybe marriage was way off of your radar and you're not interested in it at all. But what if marriage was God's design to show the love that he showed us. In Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. God laid down his life in this. God loved us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So some of you guys, are you here tonight and you're thinking, well, I'm not going to get married in a long time and I'm just going to sit and listen and that's good. Maybe I'll apply it in five, ten years. But you still got to answer this question, what are you going to do with Jesus? You still got to answer this question, what am I going to do about this obscene love that Jesus, the Son of God, demonstrated by dying on the cross in my place? That is laying down your life. No greater love hath this than to lay down your love, your life for a friend. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want us tonight, I want us to be serious. I want us to make commitments in our own heart about marriage and about, I want us to burst some bubbles and, and debunk some myths. And I want us to get those ideas out of our heads and replace them with godly ones. But more than anything, I want you to realize that Jesus demonstrated everything that we're talking about tonight. I want you to know that Jesus went first, that he showed this obscene, insane love that nobody else had ever done before, and he is our model. And so maybe you're here tonight and you came because somebody invited you, they said they were talking about dating, they are talking about marriage, you should come, you might learn something. But I really want to give you an opportunity What are you going to do about Jesus? It says in Romans 10 that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can respond to that insane love tonight. You can have a relationship with the God of the universe, with Jesus tonight. And so if that's you tonight, if you're just thinking, I I don't think I've ever done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I've never accepted what he did on the cross. I've never responded to that love. And maybe I don't have all the answers, but I want to know more. I want to respond. If that's you, you would you just raise your hand? It's just me. No one else is looking. If you would just raise your hand, it's just us looking. I don't want anybody to leave here tonight without the love of Christ. Without accepting that insane love that he demonstrated to us. If that's you tonight, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I'd like to talk with you afterwards and explain how you can know that you know that you know that you have a relationship with Jesus.